All right, welcome back, everyone. We have a great, we're gonna have a great show. We have a lot of callers uh, ready to talk to us in person. And anything I say is definitely not meant to diagnose you or replace your medical care. Check with your doctors before uh, implementing any of this information, uh, especially in the area of any type of cure, curing. We can't cure, it's legal to cure people in the state of Virginia. So uh, we're gonna avoid that. All right. <clears throat> Oh, Steve. good morning, everyone. We've got Inez. She's a, a follow-up visitor. She's from Idaho. And Inez, you are on with Dr. Berg. Oh, Inez, I'm sorry. You're muted again somehow. Isn't that frustrating? She's had a little trouble with her Bluetooth. So we're going to put her on hold for just a moment and move over to uh, Greta. Greta, uh, hang on. Let me unmute you, and we'll get you on with Dr. Berg. And Greta is a recent empty nester who had a ton of kids, and now she's <laughs> relaxed by herself. Uh, go ahead with your question, uh, Greta. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hello. Uh, I have been diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis in 2007, and uh, I'm just wondering if there are any diseases or medications that kind of play a role in, in weight loss, like because I am, it's very difficult for me. I've been keto, I, I do intermittent fasting, and I'm just stuck. You know, you're, you're battling inflammation mainly because uh, the autoimmune disease, AS, um, raises the a level of inflammation that can keep, keep that insulin resistance going. It keeps raising insulin, it creates a problem with that. So you're battling uh, this uh, additional barrier, and that's why it's so tough. So... Uh, I think the best thing for you to do is to um, do everything you can to drop the inflammation. And, and I would recommend, uh, there is a video I have on MS. I would watch that and apply it to your situation. There's a doctor out of Brazil who uses high doses of vitamin D, which I I think could greatly help you. As long as you, you know, there's to minim minimize the risk factors, which is hypercalcemia and kidney stones, you would just you know, avoid certain calcium supplements. And he, he lists all the things you can do, uh, as well as drinking enough water to keep keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. The benefits of that are huge. Now, in addition to the vitamin D, I would recommend um, Tudka uh, four times a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, simply because that's going to, um, that's interesting. It's the type of bile salt that can stimulate. Well, all bile salt, all bile salts will do this, but it stimulates the vitamin D receptor without vitamin D. So it, it kind of like tricks your body in thinking it's getting vitamin D because it's really vitamin D is really like a hormone message, right? So you you get the message uh, to say, hey, drop inflammation, and now we have more uh, insulin sensitivity. We have we have more weight loss. Um, so the two things that are going to be really important for you going in the future are number one, vitamin D and fasting, mm -hmm. periodic prolonged fasting. Um, those two things I think are going to actually turn things around for you. Okay. I do do uh, a biologic once a week. I have an injection of embryo once a week. Do you think that is causing some havoc as well? You know, I don't know. I don't have enough data to even give you an opinion one way or the other. <clears throat> you know, maybe research the side effects and see if that could be a factor. I don't know. Okay. Okay. How much vitamin D do you think a day? Because I do take a lot. Like, I'm at 30,000 I use. If you look at some of the research that this doctor out of uh, Brazil um, is recommending, it's like it's over 100,000. Oh, Wow. Now, there's a, a very specific protocol you're going to do um, with checking your parathyroid and checking your levels. And there, it's not just like, you know, you need supervision. But I think um, to create the effects, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, uh, put this thing in remission. And if you had any autoimmune disease without inflammation, that would handle like a lot of the symptoms that you have. Mm -hmm. So, um, but vitamin, <clears throat> the problem is that um, some people have a genetic defect, polymorphism with vitamin D receptor. And so uh, they require a lot more than the average person. I don't know if that's you, but there's so many barriers that block us from getting a vitamin D 
you're, you're going to need lar large amounts uh, to create this effect. Okay. But, but it's pretty cool stuff. So, yeah, watch that video I have on MS, and then I, I think I list the doctor in the description. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm taking by a doctor's, not orders, because you can't cure anything, but I'm taking 20,000 of Dr. Berg's uh, vitamin D in the morning and then 20,000 at night to help me sleep, and I'm still able to form sentences. So I think all is well in that regard. You know, can I, I want to say something about vitamin D. What's fascinating, and I will release a video this next week on this vitamin D, the, uh, you take vitamin D in international units, right? Um, but you measure vitamin D in the blood by uh, NGs per mLs, which is a different measuring thing. So if you're deficient, let's say you have 20 NGs per mL, which is low in your blood vitamin D, um, how much vitamin D do you take? Um, you know, the, the experts uh, recommend that you need, you know, roughly about 400 to 800 international units of vitamin D per day, for, like 400 to 800. Well, let's, if you take a look and convert this, uh, and I d I've done the, the math on this, if you convert 20 NGs per milliliter to your body, uh, what's inside, and I'm talking about all the blood, which an average person has like five liters of blood, that comes out to 4,000 IUs. That's actually, it's a lot more, uh, even when you're deficient. So if you're going to try to use that small uh, amount, four to 800 international units, you're never going to raise your deficiency up to normal level. So um, let's say you took 10,000 IUs, right? And then you factor in because um, you're not going to get 100% absorption. You might get 60, 70, 80% absorption, not 100%. So if you factor at that in, then you come into a normal level, starting at 10,000 IUs. And then some, sometimes people freak out because like, oh, vitamin, vitamin D toxicity, that's going to be really a problem. But if you, that, you'd have to take 50 to 100 to two to 300,000 IUs month after month, even years to achieve that, that side effect. So uh, there's just a lot of false information out there that you need to sift through. Um, great majority of the population is deficient. And um, stay tuned for this video. I, I talk about it because it's, it'll clear up a lot of confusion for people. Well, that's wonderful. And now it's quiz time. Dr. Berg, you want to... All right. Off the so first let's see. Why do heavy carb meals make you sleepy? Okay, so that's the first question. See if uh, you guys know the answer to that one. Uh, in fact, that's how I would get to sleep back when I didn't know any better. I would do a heavy carb meal because I couldn't sleep. I had insomnia, so I resorted to Ben and Jerry's. I don't know if you ever heard of that, uh, Steve. Ben and Jerry's is a type of ice cream. Never heard of it, or Hagen dazs okay. or Breyers. None of them. Right. Well, they have a lot of sugar and fat and. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you consume a pint right before bed, it puts you into what's called a sugar uh, coma. Okay, so you'll sleep. Yeah. Of course, you wake, up, you wake up feeling all puffy and inflamed and kind of brain fog, but you should sleep. Well, I'm sure you will. Well, I have avoided that stuff for some time, but I'm still not a perfect uh, eater, that's for sure. Anyway, we're going to try Inez again. Uh, Inez, can we hear you? Oh, that's such a shame. Now, I recommend you take that headset and throw it right out the window. That's awful. But in the meantime, what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, Lior as Inez gets her situation together. Now, hang on. Let me unmute uh, Lior from New York City. Lior, you're on with Hello? Dr. Berg. There you go. Hi. Hi. How are you? Um, right. I love your videos. Um, I've been watching for a number of years and have had some great success um, with a number of things. And what I want to ask about today is about, um, I'm a fairly young person to have been diagnosed with sick sinus syndrome um, and a recent pacemaker install. Um, so it's been quite a journey to receive that diagnosis. Um, at first I was told it was like, I was just upset and hysterical and that was why I was passing out. 
Then I was told to eat more salt for a number of years to avoid passing out. Um, finally, I had a pretty serious um, series of events this year. So now I have um, this whole new understanding of what's been happening. And I'm getting some very confusing advice around why a why this sick sinus syndrome comes into play and how I can best support myself with dietary modification. Um, and so I'm just curious to see what thoughts you have about the sick sinus um, and how I can support myself with um, better what, eating. Why don't you tell everyone like your symptoms? What ha what happens, and what what type of symptoms you have? Um, so I had fatigue and kind of like generic malaise for a very long time, kind of like a low grade, like just can't do much, but I'd force myself to do it anyway, <laughs> force myself to work out really hard, um, force myself to, um, you know, uh, function at a really high level because I always felt like I was lazy because I just didn't feel good. Um, but the major symptom, like that's on the daily, but then I'd have these periods where I would just like pass out with no, absolutely no warning at all. And it got to the point where it was happening in really dangerous circumstances. It never happened while driving or anything, but, um, you know, passing out in public and falling on in um, hitting my head, um, has happened. And so those were some of the you know, uh, catalysts to kind of take this a little bit more seriously because I was having more frequent attacks like that. Um, and previously, like I said, I've had this issue since I was a teenager. Um, and the previous doctors would tell me that, well, you know, you probably just, you know, were tired or maybe you stood up too quickly, you know, that kind of thing. And I went through a barrage of tests, highly invasive tests. And what I finally come to is um, the sick sinus syndrome. And so did you... Um ever um get assessed for pots no okay do you what what um do you remember exactly happening first like when what age were you when you were a teenager uh 16. 16 and what happened just before the first symptom was there any any event or any infection or any stress not that i'm aware no, no. Um, I just was, you know, getting up to get something and I fell in the kitchen and, and hit my head on like, and I was living with my parents at the time, of course. Um, and I hit my head on their counter. Um, so actually, I, I did get a tilt table test. I don't know if, if you mean that's what you mean for pots. Yeah. Um, I got actually two of those over the years, and they were both negative. Um, and so the, the way they, um, the sick sinus diagnosis came was from finding that my heart rate was getting down into like the thirties and actually stopping a couple times. I got it. Yeah. It sounds to me, um, that there's definitely an adrenal involvement, adrenal gland involvement. Uh, two things that I would do if I were you is I would search out my videos on the, uh, head traumas and what to do. And when you have head trauma, there's a, there's some things that you can do, um, because that can alter you know some uh brain function that can then be a neurological issue down the road that's harder to, def to define or find um so the two things that i would do as well as i would support um the, the parts of the brain that are involved in that mechanism which would be uh higher doses of vitamin b1 uh probably benfotamine as well so that would be very important. And plus, that's going to support the autonomic nervous system, which actually has to do with blood pressure being too low. Um, and then I would also um, do things to help support the adrenal gland. Um, one of the products that I'm going to come out with that I think would benefit you is the whole desiccated adrenal. It's uh, grass-fed. That That's good for like, like a adrenal gland that you need to build up and just support a lot more than the regular adrenal support formulas. And then the last thing um, that I would look at is that uh, some maybe some hidden uh, viral infection, like you could, you could take, like for example, the fatigue that you have, a lot of times it's like this uh, little infection to the side that it's hard to identify because it's like, like this virus can kind of kind of come out and come back in remission. I've seen the new Epstein-Barr virus where the person has just chronic fatigue syndrome. They don't know what's going on, and that can affect the adrenals. Um, there's some really, there's many different things you can do for that, but like oregano, garlic, um, 
uh, some of these other uh, herbs that you could take that are antiviral, um, that would be, I think, an area to search because um, let's say, for example, it's like some people, they take a, an antibiotic and they feel better. Well, then we know it's probably bacteria related, but if you take an antibiotic, it's not going to affect the, the viruses. So, um, and stress, stress is a big indicator, a uh, uh, thing that brings viruses out of remission. And so uh, that can create, let's say you had some viral infection when you were, I don't know, a teenager, you had um, uh, mono, for example, then later on in life, you get this stress that can bring out that virus in a way that can just make you tired. Um, especially if, if, if you get some of these triggers of stress. Um, so oregano uh, oil is a real good one. And uh, uh, garlic is a good one as well. Um, so these are just the areas that I would, I would try and try to test things out to see if you get any better. And one of them should give some relief. And then, you know, maybe you can indirectly figure out like, okay, maybe that's probably the problem, but I know what you're talking about. It's like, where are you going to go to find help? They do these tests, everything comes out normal, but it's like, okay, now what? So that's what I would do. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Lior. Enjoy New York City, and we'd love to hear back from you once you, uh, you know, have tried some of these recommendations, and we want to see you well. All right, Doc, uh, we have challenged the audience with uh, a question, and here's what they have to say about it. 75% of respondents, oh, let's read the question. Why do heavy carb meals make you sleepy like a pint of Haagen-Dazs? 75% uh, of respondents say sleepiness is caused by a spike and crash of insulin. 20% say uh, digestion requires more energy, and 5% say melatonin is triggered by high carbs. Any winners yet? Well, well everyone's correct. Everyone's correct. And what's Yay. happening, the thing that makes you tired more than anything else is the spike in insulin. And because insulin interferes with uh, certain brain chemicals that control uh, the feeling of being awake, so, or... Um, alert. And so when you start to suppress those chemicals, you feel less alert, you want to just go take a nap. So that's, that's really the big reason. And, and of course, with that comes insulin resistance, comes all these other issues, but uh, it's really the spike in insulin that will just put you into a state where you want to take a nap after dinner. This is called, Steve, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, a siesta. Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> yeah. um, so you have different, you know, cultures that have rice after a meal i know that's hard to believe uh and sometimes noodles and sometimes even potatoes sometimes corn and even and this might shock you steve but bread oh stop there are it. people that have bread uh with a meal i know even though it's carbohydrates they they might do that how dare them uh anyway uh, speaking of people let's to see who's uh, watching us and from where. So a good morning to all our viewers today from the UK, Canada, Nigeria, Indonesia, Morocco, Malaysia, Italy, Iraq, Iran, excuse me, Ireland, uh, Portugal, Romania, Hong Kong, the Philippines, uh, uh oh, uh, Martis, did I say that right, Terry? Ghana, France, the Netherlands, Russia, Taiwan, Pakistan, Mexico, Cameroon, Rwanda, Germany, Cambodia, all in one breath. Japan, India, Somalia, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, Israel, Australia, Saudi Arabia, this is unbelievable. Poland, Taiwan, Nigeria, Lithuania, Belgium, uh, Guatemala, Chile, Sweden, Peru, Puerto Rico, South Africa, Greece, and all across these United States. And I believe that must be a record. That is so wonderful to hear. And listen, we don't want to forget all our folks on social media. So why don't we kick one off from Cheryl on Facebook. She wants to know what is the best form of magnesium for leg cramps? Uh, I do magnesium citrate. Um, it's real easy to get. And um, let's say that doesn't work. It should work. Um, sometimes you need potassium. Uh, sometimes you need a little calcium. If you take all the electrolytes, that might be the best option. Um, sometimes you might even either, even need some sodium. So these are just things to think with. And then on a rare occasion, uh, you might need um, some vitamin E for those cramps because the deficiency in vitamin E will create um, cramping, even especially like weakness in the muscle, achiness in the muscle, 
a lack of endurance in your muscles. So uh, you won't be able to get very far, especially up a hill. If you take a look um, at most mountain tops where rock climbers have climbed, you'll see empty bottles of vitamin E because it, it helps you. One thing, it helps the muscles and also it helps the oxygen carrying capacity at high altitudes. So um, consider that, Steve, next time you climb Mount uh, a I don't know, Everest, I guess, I, I'm not sure which one you climbed so far, but. Uh, yeah, that's a short <laughs> hill. I go for the big ones. Okay. Absolutely. But I'll tell you what, JCB from YouTube, uh, this is terrible, had a pulmonary embolism while pregnant and have a protein and vitamin C deficiency. And her question is, can I take K2 with my D3? Aren't they kind of connected? I check with your doctor, doctor on that one. Sometimes doctors don't want you to take the K2 because it, it's too close to chemistry of the K1. Um, there's some mixed data on that. So that's one that you want to check with your doc because if, there are, if you have a blood thinner, uh, then especially uh, Coumadin, you, you can't take that. But there are blood thinners now that don't restrict the K vitamins. So that's the one that probably I would try to encourage your doctor to recommend versus the other ones that do because then what are you going to do? You can't have these dark green salads, you can't have this, so it, it becomes more difficult. Well, that's tough. Sharon from Facebook, um, should I do keto and IF while dealing with lupus? Well, if you have lupus, I mean, low carb fasting is a real good thing, actually. You don't, you, you want to do it for sure because um, you're dealing with an autoimmune disease and inflammation. And guess what? Keto, low carb healthy version, as well as intermittent fasting is going to drop your inflammation. Add some vitamin D in there as well. But uh, yeah, because a high carb diet is going to uh, worsen that condition for sure. So the answer is yes. Wonderful. So uh, Candelaria from YouTube, uh, can I eat oil that comes in the cans of codfish from Iceland? Why not? It tastes just like Ben and Jerry's, I'm sure. Would that be good for her? Well, uh, these cob, this cob liver that, by the way, I have quite a few cans in my pantry, um, it comes in its own oil, the omega-3. So, yes, you can. But I will tell you, don't make the mistake that I made where I um, consume the entire can with the oil in one sitting. You're, it's just too much fat. My, my gallbladder was overloaded, and you'll be satisfied for days. So uh, I recommend to don't eat that whole thing because you're doing cod liver. Just do like a, maybe a half of it. And then uh, maybe you have just a little bit of the oil each day. But I will say, you know, the problem with that cod liver, as soon as you open it, it doesn't last very long, in the, even in the fridge. So uh, consume it within like two days. Okay. You'll, you'll notice what I'm talking about if you kind of leave it in there a week and you're like, wow, this cod liver really is getting a little fishy here. Um, so, yeah, I've learned that through experience. Okay, well, that, that's gross. Now, I owe you and Candelaria an apology. I just said cod liver because I'm so used to it. It's just cans of cod fish. Is there any difference in your answer? So the oil out of a cod fish can. I don't know what's in that oil. Uh, it might be good, but they might put um, some other oil in there that's not good. I, I just read the label. If it's some other oil, I wouldn't do it. If it's within the – if it's cod liver, then you got a good oil. So – which, which is, you know, I was surprised to find this out. I, I spent a good amount of money to evaluate um, how the oil, the omega-3 survives uh, this heating process when you do canning, and apparently it does. I was shocked. I did a video on it. At first I thought, no way, it's, it gets destroyed. I'm talking about DHA and EPA, but it survives. All right, that's and wonderful. Proof. All right, well, let's try to trip them up again with the next true false question. True false, excuse me, question. Okay, true or false. All of the estrogen in men and women comes from testosterone. And I'm talking about uh, cellular estrogen, the estrogen in your cells. All of it comes from testosterone. Is that true or is that false? Interesting question. Okay, now we are going to try to connect once again with. Inez, Inez, uh, why don't you give it a shot and let's see if we can hear you on with Dr. Berg. Can you hear me? Oh, wonderful. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hi. How are you? Great. Good. I've asked you this question before, 
but I'm going to clarify it a little bit more and and see if we can come with a better resolution. Um, I have struggled with aura headaches, classic migraine headaches, um, most of my life. Um, they happen about they used to happen two or three times a year. Um, they were horrendous. I went to doctors and doctors and doctors, and finally um, I went to this last doctor probably in my 40s, somewhere around there, and uh, he gave me the same program that all the others had, and it doesn't work, you know, where you put the hot pack, and you, it, you don't drink, ca you drink caffeine and that kind of stuff, and um, it, it just didn't work. So. Um, I was at my wit's end, and I left the clinic, and the, this little nurse came out, and she ran out the door, and she says, "What I'm, I'm going to lunch, she goes, and I, but I'll tell you this, it's unethical what I'm going to tell you, but it works. She's... Oh, dear, Inez, I'm afraid we've lost your audio again. Isn't that terrible? But I think we have enough of your question for Dr. Berg to answer. Uh, I, think, I think I'm missing the, the key <laughs> the key point. Her nurse told her something. Um, I don't know. Can she write it in the chat? Uh, why don't you try I that? Uh, write it in the chat. But so far, she has not had any resolution uh, and been experiencing two to three uh, migraines uh, per year. And I think she's typing. This is, or if I knew how to sign, why I do that with her, but. Have her type um, in what the nurse recommended that she tried, and just so I can see what is going on. Okay. And, um, you know, um, tell you what, while she types that in there, we could probably um, we, go we, somewhere else for a bit. Oh, here we go. She said 800 to 1,200 ibuprofen. Oh, <laughs> the stuff in my tummy. Okay, so ibuprofen. Um Sounds like someone's uh, making, uh, doing some moving or packing in the background. Okay, so so since intermittent fasting, wow, this is um, see the ibuprofen will potentially get rid of the headache. The problem is it uh, messes with your liver, and so that's what we that's the problem. But you can take milk thistle, you can take uh, certain types of like NAC, which is a precursor to glutathione, that can help protect the liver. But um, can't do 20-hour fast, unfortunately. Yeah, milk thistle, that's a really good one to protect the liver. Um, now, with these, um, these headaches, um, I would watch my video on head trauma, and I'm going to tell you why. You know, being in practice, when you practice on people for 30 years, you, you know, people come in, they, they want help. And so I'm the kind of guy that wants to help them. I'll, I'll, I'll try anything. And I've used to, you know, really think outside the box and try to come up with all sorts of, uh, you know, different types of remedies. So you have to really think creatively. And I found, uh, uh, and start ask, digging in and asking questions. And there's a certain percentage of people who, um, had these pre-existing head trauma injuries, uh, with headaches, migraine headaches. And so I located the source. I mean, the, the where, where it was located in the skull, and then I, I tried a bunch of things, and I developed a technique. And you can do a search on Google, uh, YouTube to find that technique. But um, it's what really handled um, not the great majority, but a, a smaller majority of the people had this head trauma that uh, if you do this technique, it, it seemed to really help these people. So um, you might want to learn that and try it because uh, especially if there's no reason for headaches, you know, you have a gallbladder connection to the headache. You have a, a salt deficiency connection. Um, there's also a, a menstrual cycle or an estrogen um, connection. Uh, no gallbladder, but a bypass. So I would definitely watch my videos on gallbladder and how to do acupressure on the gallbladder and the pancreas in relationship to headaches because there's these two phrenic nerves that come up through your diaphragm up to the neck and um, they can keep, if there's any type of bloating or digestive issue in the, in the bile ducts, not even the gallbladder because you don't have one, uh, that can refer problems up to the head and cause a headache. So uh, what is the remedy for that? Do the acupressure as well as take purified bowel salts. You could, 
Um, I would also take in addition to those bile salts uh, at a meal, like the gallbladder formula, I would take Tudka, which is a type of bile salt that you could take two in the morning, two in the afternoon. That will actually open up those bile duct pipes and drain them and uh, watch what happens. So a lot of times the headaches uh, lift and they feel much better. They feel less, less there. So that's what I would do. All right, All right, Inez. Well, uh, everyone around the world, I'm sure, hopes that you get rid of those nasty uh, migraines. That is terrible. And Dr. Berg, we have challenged the audience with the next question, and we asked them, true, false, all of the estrogen in men and women comes from testosterone, and 55% say that that's not true. 45% say it is true. Who's right? You know... I, I thought that would be uh, false, but it is true. If you'll just, just look it up, you can look it up. Um, even in women, it comes from testosterone, which is fascinating. Now, I'm talking about cellular, the estrogen in the cells, okay? So there's a conversion that takes place from this testosterone, and it's, 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 and it's not just testosterone. There's other androgens involved, but um, there's a conversion that takes place with an enzyme called aromatase. And so if you look at the aromatase inhibitors on the market, they're mainly for cancer, but they're also for men that are developing, um, you know, breast tissue and issues with that as well because their estrogen is too high. So this enzyme converts more of this testosterone to estrogen, giving someone two problems one is too much estrogen and two very low testosterone so i will be doing a video on that today actually and releasing it next week but that's um now the question is why is this happening what triggers aromatase well um it's plastics um in the environment an average person is consuming about the size of a uh, credit card plastic every single week and these plastics are not good chemicals in the environment. They all activate this aromatase and we're do, doing this big conversion. So you need to get the plastic out of your diet, number one. And there's many ways to do that. But also um, zinc will help increase the, um, the testosterone. And uh, there's also natural <clears throat> aromat uh, um, inhibitors that you can take and that and i've done videos on that like one inhibitor would be um the stinging nettle root another inhibitor would be um dim it's from cruciferous vegetables so there's there's a lot of things that you can take but stay tuned for the video so i can clarify this and make it really simple to understand wonderful okay so uh over to facebook angie how can i reverse kidney failure this sounds awful <laughs> I don't know. I, I have no idea your history, what, what happened or how, what severity it is. But um, I'm just going to tell you that being on a high carb diet um, puts you at risk for kidney problems, especially if you're, you have insulin resistance and you're pre-diabetic. If you take a look at diabetics, they're really at risk. So they're doing a lot of carbs. You're doing too many carbs. Carbs um, give you too much glucose and that oxidizes uh, four tissues, the kidney tissue the brain and nerve tissue, the eye tissue, and the vascular tissue. Other than that, it doesn't do anything. Um, but if you were to go on a healthy keto plan and do intermittent fasting, I bet you that would improve kidney function. So to prove that, I would try it and see how you do. But you need to get on the standard thing of uh, healthy keto and intermittent fasting. It's, it's hands down, it's the most important thing one can do to create an, a big impact on their health, not just weight loss. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I remember Dr. Berg, you put it in perspective for me so well, when uh, everyone gets sort of twitchy about keto or low carbs and you said, well, the opposite, Steve, why don't you eat a couple cups of sugar and see if that remedies your problem every day? I mean, it's absurd. And that's the, that's the deal. So the opposite of that is, you know, shoving down Snicker bars in the hopes that it's gonna somehow prevent you from the dangers of keto, it's nonsense. So anyway, here we go. Let's go with another question, Dr. Berg. Let them have it. All right. Why, why do some people crave salty foods or salty anything, snacks, after they eat 
sweets. So here you are, you eat some sweets, and then you, you're searching around for your potato chips that you have in the pantry. Steve. All right. Why is that? Well, what's happening? Come on. Come on, audience. Um, let's get some great answers there. By the way, we're going to go to uh, Shu Fei Fan. That is his name, and he is from San Diego. And we're so glad to have him on. His picture's a little askew, and I'm going to fix that. Go ahead, Shu Fei. Uh, you're on with Dr. Bird. Oops, let's see. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, sir. Okay. You can hear me? Sure can. Yes. Good. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me, doctor. Um, I have a condition that I did gallbladder removal about four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking for the having a healthy diet, not necessarily for weight loss, because um, I'm not overweight. But um, I'm new and I'm eager to do the keto diet and the intermittent fasting because I, from my research, I really find this a very interesting, you know, healthy way of living. But I heard that uh, people say you should never be hungry. In my case, if I have gallbladder removed, is that the case? And uh, if I'm, my question is, if I'm going to do it, what is the proper way to do the keto and the intermittent the fasting? And, uh, you know, um, how about a long time fasting, say fasting for a whole day? Can I do that? Absolutely. I, I think it would be a great thing for you to, to do. And you'll see once you start it how, how well you feel, not just for weight loss. But um, without the gallbladder, um, now you have this little tube that goes from your liver right to the small intestine. There's no more... Um, storing or concentrating this bile. So that being said, um, sometimes down the road you become bile deficient because you don't you don't have that that certain amount that's squeezed into the uh, the small intestine to help break down this food. So the the weaknesses that you have are really the uh, ability to digest and handle fat, right? Which the ketogenic diet is high fat. And as well as the extraction of the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K, omega-3 fatty acids as well. So I mm. think what would be very beneficial is to do the keto, but don't add additional fat. For example, don't add, um, like a lot of people do, the keto fat bomb cookies. Don't add the MCT oil. Don't add a stick of butter right after the meal. <laughs> Just eat the fat that normally comes with the meal. And, um, and also... I would take a uh, like a gallbladder formula or a um, a purified bile salt to help you with with the digestion of the fat, just because you don't have enough bile. Um, so you take that with your meals. Take a couple of those with your meals, and I think you'll you'll do very well. Now, one little point about that: there with some people, um, depending on the surgery, um, sometimes they have too much bile coming from the liver that's draining out in which case the side effect from that is diarrhea. So anytime you get diarrhea, just realize that's probably you're taking too much bile. You have to cut back and then you have an indicator of, to know how much you need. But yeah, how to start keto. I think um, if you just go to drberg.com and click blog, I have a video that says start here. And then the second video is watch this one next. <laughs> And I just lay it out, step one, two, three, four. And, you, and you'll see there's downloads of, uh, I have my, the whole diet download. You just get it for free and download it and read it. And it's called Easy Keto and, and find out exactly how to do it. I see. Uh, thank you very much, doctor. You're welcome. All right, Shufei, who needs a gallbladder? By golly, we'll live on uh, without that darn thing. Now let's see, uh, oh yes. Quiz answer for number three, stand by. And let's go pick up the quiz. The quiz is why do people crave salty food after eating sweet food? And the survey, excuse me, 80% uh, say that sugar depletes the key electrolytes like salt, 10% say dehydration, and 10% say it's because of low potassium. You know, here, when, you, when you're low, Everyone's right, but here's the thing. When you're low in potassium, there's nothing in your body that 
uh, will tell you to crave potassium. Like I, potassium is in vegetables, right? You're not going to start craving vegetables, unfortunately. So there's no indication indicator that kind of tells your body it's time to eat this or that. But with salt, there is. But when you eat sweets, um, sugar is uh, very osmotic. Now, what does that mean in layperson's terms? It, it means that it tends to uh, alter the fluids um, inside the cell to a certain degree, and you start dumping sodium out of the cell. And so you have this interesting deficiency thing where all of a sudden now you need some salt when you have sugar. Um, so instead of consuming potato chips, try some sea salt. That might be better. But of course, if you're on keto, you're not going to do that in the first place. So really the answer is don't eat the sweets, Steve. Well, I'll tell you what, what I used to do, I think my problem with that was more psychological than physiological. So I'd go through McDonald's and I get a hot fudge sundae with nuts for health. Then I pull out and I, and I eat it and I think, you know, that's rotten. You need something better in your stomach instead of just some stupid hot fudge sundae. So I pull back to McDonald's, get a quarter pounder with a medium fry, thinking that that would you're, somehow. You're kidding, right? you, no, you actually, actually that's the, the, true. I would do that. And I think so. It, it, the last thing that goes in your stomach should be some highly delicious and, and uh, healthful food like a Big Mac or whatever and fries. Oh, and a Diet Coke. And so somehow I thought if you could cover it up the horrible hot fudge Sunday with that, that you'd be on your way to better health. Now, I don't do that anymore, and I didn't find any great results, but that's what I did, sticking to it. Steve, I've done similar things I know. I, I, um, one of the things that um, I would crave more than anything is um, Doritos, and not just a little bag, the largest mega bag you can find, which is the big ones. I would down that without even thinking twice. Um, and so little did I know, you got this empty carbohydrate with these addictive spices that just keep you eating. You can't just eat one. And um, so we found a, a recipe, a keto friendly recipe that is pretty darn similar to Doritos. And I'm going to be sharing it with everyone on the, um, on the recipe site. It's right on the YouTube channel very soon. So stay tuned for that because you will want to make those. If you like salty foods, you can have these chips and they have these great seasonings and uh, it's almost identical to Doritos, but without the addiction. Wonderful. Okay, well, the, the audience is doing so fabulous with questions. Let's hit them with another one. Okay, so vitamin D deficiency occurs most often um, in what part of the world? What part of the world has the most vitamin D deficiency problem? Okay, that's the question and we'll wait for your answer. In the meantime, we're going all the way to Tokyo, and we're going to talk to Natalia from Tokyo. And so, Natalia, if you would un unmute yourself, you're on with Dr. Bird. Oh, hello, Dr. Bird. How are hello. You? Uh, hello, how are you doing? Great, you? thanks. Um, so, I would like uh, to ask you a question. Uh, about um, so uh, on the seventh uh, June, I started uh, keto diet, and on July twenty um, first, it was the last time I had my period. And uh, I like to give you a little background if it's okay. Go ahead, Natalia. So. Um, when uh, I was, since I was a child, I, I always had kind of sleeping problem, and that got really, really bad, especially since I was 15 years old. And um, that has been a long story. Fast forward to now, I'm 29 years old. And um, um, months ago, I discovered uh, the ketogenic diet and uh, your channel, so I decided to give it a try. And, um, and it worked really well. I've been sleeping much better better than I've had um, since, since I was 15 years old, I think. And uh, the problem is um, I lost my period and I don't have it since the months ago. So we're going to help you find out where it went, where you lost it. <laughs> Do you remember where you, where you put it last? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, I think one of the um, things you can try because 
This relates to pre-existing nutritional deficiencies. It could be any number of nutrients. So that's why I recommend to enhance your diet with enough nutrient type foods as well. But inositol is the nutrient that you need. Inositol um, tends to help you get your period back. It helps to regulate the relationship between the pituitary and your ovaries. That's one thing I would definitely try. And then also just watch my videos on some other other things you can do if that doesn't work, but usually that should that should work. Inositol, it's a type of B vitamin, um, and it's actually a sweet vitamin without the sugar. I am taking uh, B vitamins at the complex. Good. Um, are you taking inositol as a separate uh, vitamin? Uh, no, I'm not. Try that, and then watch my video on um, losing period during during um, keto or fasting, and then you can get more uh, more solutions. But inositol is what I would I would definitely try. Okay. And inositol will also help um, if you lost your period during menopause, and then all of a sudden it reappeared when you're 65 years old. You could take inositol to to re help regulate that because that's, I mean. Some women would kill to be able to get rid of their um, period, right? But uh, other other women want their period. It's a regular thing. So it's really depending on you what you want. But I'm being sarcastic. You, everyone needs the normal regulation of their period. But inositol just helps to put that regulation in and uh, mainly from the higher hormones that are controlling it uh, from the pituitary and hypothalamus. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Boy, women are just so wonderful, but I'm glad I'm a man. It's so much simpler. You know, it just really is. And I salute all the women for putting up with everything they have to and having our beautiful children and all the great things they do. They are really burdened with a great deal more than boys. So uh, with that said, let's see. I am going to go to our latest quiz question, and let's see how smart the audience is on this one. Vitamin D deficiency occurs most often in which part of the world and 78%, boy, Terry is really getting down to the percentage points, uh, say northernmost regions of the earth, 12% say regions with dark skin populations, 10% say the southernmost regions of the earth. They are absolutely all over the place. Sort this out for us, doctor. It's an area that probably has more sun than most places. And uh, the answer is the Middle East. Goodness. The Middle East. Now, Steve, do you know why that is? I have zero idea. Well, there's two reasons. One is that their the culture, uh, you know, has more clothing, so they're not out there exposing their skin to the sunlight to get the vitamin D because it's too hot. Interesting. Number one, and number two, um, they consume more sugar than any other um, countries in the world too, and the sugar creates metabolic syndrome, and metabolic syndrome creates insulin resistance. And insulin resistance blocks your ability to absorb vitamin D. And so does obesity, and so does age, and so does a, a problem with your gut, and so does a problem with your liver. So there's a lot of barriers there in the absorption of vitamin D. But definitely it's the Middle East. That's, I mean, 80% of the entire Middle East is deficient in vitamin D. So, yeah. That's interesting. interesting. And sugar, that... That surprises me. I didn't think that the Arab nations would have such an issue with that. I thought that was exclusively an American thing, but I'm so glad they're sharing yeah. in that burden. Yeah, it's a situation. All right, so let's see. Why don't we go on with the final question uh, of the day? And by the way, I'm going to remind you, Dr. Berg, we are also, before we get out of here, want to talk about the upcoming videos because that's always so exciting. But here's the last question of the day, a true-false. Okay. True or false, vitamin D is easily absorbed. That's simple. Is that true? Who knows? Now, uh, we're going to go to Barry, who unfortunately doesn't have a image, but he hopefully has a voice. Uh, Barry, are you there? Can you hear us? Hello, Dr. Brooke. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can. Okay, awesome. Uh, First of all, thanks, Dr. Work, for doing everything that you do. It's been amazing. And uh, secondly, yeah, it's unfortunate that I am having difficulties with my camera this morning. But just to give you some background on my situation, I'm a male in uh, late 20s. And um, before I start there, uh, I'm calling in from Atlanta. So uh, I'm a male in late 20s and I've been lacto-vegetarian my whole life. 
and you know been on your recommended keto diet since june lost around 13 to 15 pounds and i was recently diagnosed with you know uh, androgenic alopecia so i still have some subcutaneous fat around my belly and which i'm you know actively trying to uh, get rid of but given that you know with my recent hormonal testing it was found that my total estrogen levels are you know way above the uh, normal levels but my estradiol seems within the normal range and my PCP was hesitant to, you know, uh, get me on the dim supplements, citing, you know, there is cancer risk. And uh, I saw an endocrinologist uh, yesterday, and she had never heard of something called dim. So my question is, you know, mainly around uh, the risk of profile of taking dim supplements. And, uh, you know, yeah. Okay, so dim is a stabilized version of indole 3 carbonyl which is a phytonutrient that comes from cruciferous vegetables. So the reason why they don't use other phytonutrients is because they're not stable. So it's a stable version. And so what it does is it, um, it helps to inhibit that enzyme I talked about so you don't convert all your testosterone to estrogen. Now, it is also a phytoestrogen. So if you are deficient, it'll raise it, but in no way, shape, or form is it linked to cancer. <laughs> In fact, think about, the, I mean, there are so many studies that you can, in fact, I don't even know if I could pull it up right now, but I have a, an entire thick book of all the studies that cruciferous has on anti-cancer effects. It's like for, for someone to just say that it's even linked, just doesn't have enough data to make an, give you an opinion. So you really want to go with someone that has more experience um, and not guessing and and helping you recommend or not recommend, but um, alopecia uh, is a problem with, um, it's an autoimmune sometimes. Um, it could be autoimmune usually, well, it al always is autoimmune, but I think um, a couple things you can take for that, which are really important. Um, there's actually quite a few, um, but one would be the um, DIM, and I would definitely take that because it sounds like you have this imbalance. Um, but also, like stinging nettle root is a really good one as well, and that supports the liver. And um, there are just a whole series of other nutrients um, that you can take that are um, aromatase inhibitors. And that's really what you want to focus on, elimination of plastics in your diet, and then also to help these ratios um, of testosterone to estrogen, because it sounds like there's an issue with that. The other thing that I would take is zinc. Zinc is a um, really important um, trace mineral to help rebalance testosterone. Um, and also just um, find, find someone in your area maybe that has a lot more experience in natural uh, remedies and also using dim because if they've never heard of, of it this tells you they don't they can't give you a valid opinion because they just don't have the data i mean it's quite amazing that product is uh, i mean the national institutes of health are studying that as a is a credible treatment for cancer um cervical dysplasia uh cancer of the throat um HPV, um, which is a virus, human papillomavirus. I mean, the uh, NIH is studying that. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of other research as well. So, you know, it's hard for a doctor to be up, up on all these different research studies, but it's, it's a credible therapy, and uh, um, I, think, um, I think it could help you. Awesome. And would you say uh, androgenic alopecia is also autoimmune uh, disorder that I have? Yes, I, th I think it is. Um, yeah, when yeah. my sport affecting uh, miniaturization. And I've also been taking zinc uh, 13 milligrams uh, every day since uh, February of this year. And so That's I'm good. Gonna... That's good. You're on the right path. Um, are you losing your hair? Yeah, I am losing my hair. Uh, it's miniaturizing. I can see vellus hairs uh, on my hairline, and, you know, I have receding temples. Okay. Um, 
Try not, I, you know, just I don't want. Sense. I don't want to give you any um, claims about my new hair formula, but all I'm going to say is I designed it more to support that type of condition, which is alopecia, more than other conditions. But I'm not going to make any claims on the air here. But um, there's quite a few new ingredients that target that issue, and I'm going to be doing a, a video on that as well. But uh, um, yeah, that's all I want to say. That's very helpful. Well, that's terrific, right. sir. We hope uh, you do terrifically in those pursuits. And let's see, let's uh, quickly go back to social media. And Latricia from YouTube, is there a multivitamin or supplement that you'd recommend for hormonal balance? What do you say, Doc? Um, you know, it really depends on what hormone. But if you're talking about um, women, you know, you have the, the ovarian hormones. Um, you know, I have, I, have, I have supplements to help support the adrenal. I have supplements like uh, sea kelp, for example, to support the uh, female uh, ovarian cycle, you know, issues with that. And also fibrocystic breast, that's a really good one. Um, and um, it's good for the thyroid as well. And then you also have, um, you know, the basic, I don't have a multivitamin, but I, my multivitamin in general would be the keto energy because it has pretty much every nutrient in there. It's a really natural, good thing to take. Um, but um, yeah, I really need more data to give you a better answer on that. All right, well, that's terrific. Well, listen. Let's see if I can see these. Okay, so. Oh, stand by Dr. Berg, we have to go back on. Here. In chromium, um, which I, honestly, Steve, I think I released that one already. Uh, the benefits of milk thistle, which I think I released that. I don't know where they got that from. Vitamin D toxicity course. Um, so I think this is an outdated list because I already released the one on soda melts your bones. I think I released that today. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you, um, I have some incredible, incredible videos. One's going to be on this whole confusion of how much vitamin D that's in your blood versus the units that you would use taking in supplements. That's going to be a really good video. Um, I have other videos on a whole series of vitamin D videos. I have a whole series of videos on a new, very interesting topic on testosterone and estrogen, uh, especially for post-menopause women with, with testosterone problems. And a lot of times they don't even focus on that. They're just focused on you know, raising their estrogen or progesterone, but what about testosterone? That's gonna be very important. Um, let's see what else I have, Steve. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, some new natural ways to address a fatty liver, which is always a, a good good topic to talk about. And I also have um, some do-it-yourself techniques for sleep and this thing called stress. If you've ever experienced stress before, at least once in your life, then you want to watch that video. Wow, you know, one of the, the uh, great detriments of COVID is apparently the need for liver transplants has skyrocketed because for people that have a propensity to drink too much or maybe other unhealthful uh, lifestyles, uh, they just don't have enough livers to go around. And apparently over the year and a half that we've had COVID, there's just tons of people whose livers are failing. So if you're at all at risk, we hope that you would, first of all, come to grips with whatever, you know, proclivity you have toward drugs or alcohol. And then secondly, listen to Dr. Burke so we can keep that thing nice and healthy and free of fat. Absolutely, Steve. So thank you for watching. I appreciate all your wonderful comments. Stay tuned next week, same time, same place. Well, actually the different time, but same time of the day.